The Blackfoot Robe, a rare meteorite, Bull the Rhino, and Gordo the Barosaurus. Just a handful of objects found in the Royal Ontario Museum. Objects Canadian artists and authors have written about in the collection of essays called Every Object Has a Story. Joining us now to tell us more about the book and the history of the ROM, we welcome Janet Carding. She is the director and the CEO of the Royal Ontario Museum. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Okay, we're going to talk about some of the objects in this wonderful book uh, that the ROM has put together, but I want to start by talking about the history uh, of the ROM. You told me that it opened in March 19, uh, 1914. Absolutely. It was opened by the Duke of Connaught, who was the Governor General at the time. And he arrived in a fanfare of glory. They opened the museum. And for the first time, um, Toronto and Ontario had its own major museum. And it had been built with this really ambitious agenda. Um, the first uh, chair of the Board of Trustees, Sir Edmund Walker, he decided that Toronto, as a great city of the future, was going to need a museum like the British Museum or the Metropolitan Museum. And so he worked with the government and he worked with the university and he established the ROM. OK, what was its mandate? Its mandate right from the very beginning was to be encyclopedic. It actually had n um, five directors when it opened and each one had their own collection. And from that, we've grown to the over 100 collections that we have now. But right from the very beginning, baked into the DNA of the ROM, was that it was about natural history and cultures. And it was about anything and everything. Mm. How's the mandate changed? Um, my sense is that the mandates actually remain pretty much the same. The way we talk about it now is that our job is to really provide people sort of access into that encyclopedia and help them make connections to the world. And of course, help people connect with each other, all the different cultures of the world, for instance, that are here in Toronto. So my sense is the mandate stayed the same, but how we do it has actually mm. changed a lot. We'll talk about uh, how, how the ROM has evolved over the last century. Mm. When the five directors, when the founders uh, uh, came about and they you know, start this museum from scratch, how did they sort of take stock of what people were interested in? Well, I think it's probably fair to say that they were coming very much from an academic background. They were all professors at the University of Toronto. They were all scholars in their own area. And so they relied as connoisseurs, as being experts in the material. And so, for instance, Corelli, he was the first director of art and archaeology. He was somebody who was already an Egyptologist. He'd been out in the field. He'd then been in London. He knew the dealers well. He was collecting in New York and here in Toronto. He was able to put together what he thought would be great items for people to see. And, and actually, he had very good taste and a very good eye. And mm. so we've, we've reaped the benefits of that for years. What are some of the first objects Ron had? Well, for instance, um, on March the 19th, we used one of the objects that Corelli had collected as, as our mascot, if you like, for the day. It was an Egyptian mummified cat. And Corelli had bought it in, in, in Cairo, I think in something like 1908, 1909. He'd brought it back to Toronto. And it's been on display for 100 years mm. ever since. My worry when we were looking at that object is that I knew that there were some fakes that were sold to tourists at the time. And so the question was, was had Corelli actually bought a real mummified cat? And had he? We've done the x-rays and actually he, he did. <laughs> so as I say, very good taste, very discerning connoisseur. And, and that, that was how the museum's collections came together. And the real deal. Absolutely. Okay, so now in 2014, uh, I, I guess the ROM probably always played this dual role in terms of preserving culture and drawing people in. But... I think nowadays, I mean, kind of that's, that's maybe a more challenging balancing act. So how do you achieve that? How do you be a tourist attraction and at the same time be this encyclopedic knowledge of, of culture and history? Well, it is a challenge. And what we know at the moment is that everything is changing very quickly. You know, we're moving into an era where information is now all around us. We almost have too much information. And the online world has changed the way that, that we all work. And so really, if you think about a museum, that's no longer the first place that you go to to actually see something. It's not necessarily a place where you get information, but it is the place that you come to to see the real thing. And it is a place where actually you can have the kind of experience that you can't have if you're just looking at something uh, in a book or online. And so we're concentrating increasingly on the kind of experience that you can have. And part of what we're doing just to make it really special is to say, well, what can this museum do that you can't do in any other place? And the key to it actually turns out to be giving you the chance to meet the people who work at the mm, museum. You can't touch the objects. So you Most can, of them you can't right. touch. Some of them you can. But what we're increasingly doing is saying, if you can meet 
the people like Corelli, but the people, the curators that we have now in the museum, you can you can ask them questions, you can understand, you know, what they what they think is important, you can understand more about the collections, and so we're increasingly putting visitors in in the same space as the curators, and then seeing what happens. How many curators do you have now? Um, we have uh, around 30 curators, and the majority of them are still cross-appointed to the University of Toronto, just as they were when we started out. So the role of the curator since Corelli's time, just give us a sense. I mean, we, like you said, you're bringing these people out from behind the curtain now, but we the public really don't know much about curation when it comes to museum. How has, how has their role changed over time? Well, I think, I think we really look to our curators now to be storytellers. And so they're very skilled, very knowledgeable, but at the same time, they can also tell us what's important and why and how we came to have the objects in our collections. And that's, that's one of the things that we find more and more that people want to know. They want to know not just you know, how, what is this thing in our galleries, but why is it important and why should I care? Mm -hmm. and, so, and so everybody's a curator nowadays. We're hearing about people curating their lives. We're hearing about people curating um, you know, the way that they move through the world and the way that they represent themselves online. In that sense, curation is something that our curators have been doing for years. Mm. But we're seeing that in a more rounded way, you know, in the same way that like a journalist might now write articles, but also have people who follow them on social media and might also be, a, you know, speak in public. Our curators are increasingly doing all of these different things. They're, they're working on lots of different platforms, communicating in lots of different ways. And I have to say they're really enjoying it. Yeah, they've got much more of a public profile. Exactly. When they go about curating material, I mean, how, how does that process happen? What criteria does the ROM have for curating material? Well, we have our original mandate, which of course is encyclopedic. Which is very broad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, so, and so again, we rely on the, the research agenda um, that, that the curators are putting forward and also what opportunities there are. So. If something like a whale comes up, that's an opportunity <laughs> to expand the collections. But at the same time, we're increasingly looking to say, what are the stories that the public really wants to hear? And so a lot of our exhibition and our program, our public program, really is being done in partnership with our visitors. What is it that they want to know more about? What is it that we can actually really add to their experience by bringing to them? And so increasingly, whether it's you know, coming to the museum at different times of the day, whether it's using technology in different ways, whether it's actually just creating something which is fantastic that you do with your family because families are telling us that they want the time that they spend together to be really precious. The museum's doing a lot of that too. Okay, let me put you on the spot. What do you think the public wants to see at the ROM? I think the public wants to have an experience that they can get involved in and that feels alive. I think people want to do something that feels really memorable. And that, I have to say, can be as much about seeing something that's really special, seeing it with somebody who makes it really special, like a curator. Or it could be, say, that you come on a Friday evening where we, where we run our social program and that you see something with your friends and it's part of a social atmosphere. And it's just a fantastic Friday place to be. Friday night's the ROM. Big hit. Oh, huge hit. All right. So there's 21 objects. How many, mm -hmm. how many objects does ROM have? About six million. Okay. <laughs> So not an easy task at selecting <laughs> no. 21. How'd you do that? Well, um, we work with the experts, the curators, and we put together a list and we knew that we couldn't get it down to a small number because it's the encyclopedic aspect again. So we put together a, a, a long list and then we worked with um, the Walrus Foundation, who are our partners in this project with the House of Anansi Press. And they matched up the objects with uh, a Canadian writer or thinker or storyteller. And it was that combination that really got us to 21. I think we were supposed to be 20, but in the end there were 21 <laughs> great stories that we could tell, so we went with 21. They're, they are lovely stories. We are talking about this uh, a bit before we started taping, the diversity of stories and what they, how the writer, whether you know it's an academic like Margaret McMillan or Charlotte Gray or Lawrence Hill or Joseph Boyd and uh, Deepa Mehta, and, uh, they, they connected in their own unique ways to the objects. They, used, they saw each object through their lens. Was that part of the plan? Absolutely, absolutely. We've, we've written histories of the ROM before. When, when it was our 75th anniversary, we had a history. And, and our history is important to us, of course. We're a museum. And so we wanted to include that. But we thought, wouldn't it be much better to really think about how these objects inspire people and how these objects can be used to tell stories? And so the idea of working with a group of storytellers, our curators, 
characters have, have talked about the object and given some element of its history, but then handing over the reins to somebody like Joseph Boyden or like Sherry Fitch, who then is inspired by the object and, and goes on to produce something lovely from that. We thought that that would be more captivating to do for our hundreds, and I think it's worked out really well. I, as I said to you earlier, I think this book is, is just phenomenal because the stories really... I mean, I saw some of the things that I've seen before and thought of them in a, in a very... Uh, new way in reading the book. And I guess it's sort of, um, you know, I, I want to ask you, do these objects sort of speak for themselves or, or do you need the story attached to them to, to really appreciate them? I think, I think that um, objects do speak to people and they speak to them in different ways. And some objects speak more loudly than others. So one of my favourite um, parts of the book is, um, is Bull the White Rhino and, uh, and uh, David McFarlane, who's written this lovely piece, and he muses about about why it is that we have animals in museums, about about the possible extinction of the rhino, about about age and seniority. And what I love about that is he writes beautifully. But these are the sorts of things that I can imagine going through a visitor's head as they stand in front of the rhino in the museum every day. And I quite often hear, for instance, visitors musing about their own mortality because they've seen something preserved in a museum. And so it's that insight that it gives mm. us into the kind of experience people bring. So I think this helps people think differently about the objects, but I know that our visitors, you know, the objects inspire many different things in them. What I don't want is that an object might be mute and you don't want a situation where somehow you feel that you don't know enough or that, that you need something extra so that you can really appreciate an object. And that's where, again, I think the interpretation that we do in the museum and our curator skill really comes to the fore. Okay, we just put up the picture uh, of, of the rhino there. Mm -hmm. um, it is interesting. I, I love the David McFarlane essay because it, you know, sp speaks to sort of uh, the, the time of Botox and not appreciating a sort of, I think he make, says, you don't see a Winston Churchill politician anymore. And I've never looked at the rhino and, and thought of it in that way. But tell me, how did, how did the rhino come to be at the ROM? Well, um, the rhino used to be at Toronto Zoo, and, and this is before I came to Toronto, but, but it's, a, it's a famous story. So, so Bull the rhino was, was really a much-loved animal at the zoo, and, and, and when Bull died, it became an opportunity for the museum. We were planning a gallery on biodiversity. What better animal than a rhino to be able to think about the, the diversity of life on Earth? I mean, these extraordinary animals, but at the same time, how fragile they are as a species and the incredible conservation efforts that are now going into making sure that there are still wild rhinos. It became a great way for us to be able to tell that particular story alongside all the other stories. Okay, let's talk about a few more objects uh, in the book. Let's bring up this one. This is a Blackfoot robe, and Joseph Boyden uh, mm. wrote the essay that goes along with it. What's interesting about this robe? Well, I think what's fascinating about this robe is how it's become disconnected from its own history. And so really sadly, we don't know who made the robe. We don't know the identity of that, of that person. We've been able to interpret the history um, that's represented on that robe. But the robe itself has been on a journey that took it from Canada all the way to Scotland and then back again to the ROM. And Joseph Boyden, again, he thinks about that journey and what that might mean, but also what that might mean that we have, that we have histories where some of the objects can no longer speak for themselves, where we don't have all the information that, that might be a constant lineage so that we can understand who, um, who assembled or put together a particular piece. And I think, again, that's an important part of museum work, is how do we try and uncover histories of objects such as the Blackfoot robe that are really important, but, but sometimes haven't ever been preserved for history before. How did it come to the ROM? It was, uh, it was, it was, it came to the ROM after somebody in Scotland went to um, a house that was being cleared, bought the robe when they were quite young, I think in the 1950s, in a, the equivalent of a, of a garage sale, and then actually you know, thought that it might come to the ROM after that. And so mm. we purchased it, I think, about uh, five or ten years ago. And I think if I recall uh, reading the story correctly, that it was a young girl who used, used the robe, she, she liked playing uh, cowboys and Indians, and she used the robe to play with as a child. Well, I think certainly she was inspired by it as a child. And then when we, we, we delved back to see what of the history we could uncover, and so we went back and spoke to the people who had been the family that had lived at the house where she bought the robe and it turned out that they'd used it for dressing up as well and so I mean isn't it fascinating how objects have their own biography and mm. they move through history and they they pick up these different stories as they go along all right let's bring up another one I'm not sure if I pronounce this Ikum or Icum but see let's call it the Icum headdress mm -hmm. if 
I'm saying it wrong, I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, and the poem is by Uzoma Esanwane. Mm -hmm. um, what's important about, about this headdress? Well, these, these sorts of headdresses are, are important because they're part of the masked culture um, in that part of Africa. And so this is a very uh, important piece of ritual. Um, at the same time, it's an incredibly beautifully made object that's part of a craft tradition that, that unfortunately is not really there uh, anymore. And so this comes to us both as a great example of craftsmanship, but also of the kind of ritual that would have been um, about um, girls moving into womanhood and some of the ceremonies that would have been associated with this. So this is an object that in itself has multiple layers. And so it's great to have, um, to have a poem that then starts to actually unpack mm. those multiple layers of the object. And in some ways, a poem is a great way to do that, is to think about something that has different stories to tell. Now, if my kid at the museum was standing by that, she would probably say, Mama, why, well, she might not say this articulately, why do I need to know about this? Why do we need to know about this kind of headdress as Canadians? Well, one of the great things I think is important for all of us is to think about how the world is made up of people who come from many different cultural backgrounds. And it's actually by starting to think about how um, people are different and cultures are different. And, and a museum is a great place to experience different cultures. And so the idea that that um, in a different part of the world, there might be a different way that you move from being a child to an adult, is something that then allows people to reflect for themselves about, about their own culture, how they fit in, and how they fit into the broader world, how people belong. D does the headdress say anything about gender roles? Um, I think so, in that what, what, what's not clear is whether it was danced by a man or danced by a woman. And so there are some examples in, um, of these kind of ceremonies where sometimes actually people take different roles. And so, again, it just starts to suggest that, um, that in terms of looking at these sorts of objects, there are lots of different layers that you can unpeel, almost like an onion. Okay. For anyone who's walked into the ROM, you can't miss this, this next object. This <laughs> of, I mean, you see the outside of the ROM, which, which people talk about all the time. You walk in, you can't miss Gordo, the Barosaurus. It, it's there. He's huge. Tell me about Gordo. Okay, Gordo is, um, he's one of our most famous dinosaurs. He's also one of the largest dinosaurs in North America. And, uh, and he's, uh, he's, he's our skeleton in our closet for the museum. <laughs> in that he was, he was packed away on various different shelves for about 45 years. And it wasn't until Dave Evans, who is a talented vertebrate paleontologist, so who works on dinosaurs and related material, he started to realize as he was putting together the plans for the new dinosaur exhibition that actually what he thought were separate bones from separate examples of an animal were actually all from the same example. And so he was able to reassemble the skeleton for the first time in a long time and realized that he had, you know, a, a very good skeleton, you know, it's about half complete in fossil material, and also that it was this extraordinary Barosaurus. And so it was one of the one of the biggest animals that has lived. Okay. Why is it called Gordo? Um, it's <laughs> nicknamed after the person who um, who helped with the original acquisition. What a great mm -hmm. name for a dinosaur. Yeah. You don't get a better name than Gordo for a no, dinosaur. Museums are funny like that. It's funny <laughs> how these sorts of things that come together. And so Gordo, Gordo has, be, has moved from being a name that was associated with the person to now something that we even use for our dinosaur mascot. <laughs> okay, this is a totally different one, a totally different size. Let's bring up this black opal ring, which Margaret McMillan writes a, a beautiful. And mm -hmm. I want to ask you to, tell, to retell her story in a minute, but tell us about the black opal ring, first of all. So black opals are, uh, opals themselves are very rare gemstones. Black opals are very rare. This comes from a part of Australia called Lightning Ridge, which I happen to have been to because mm. I used to work in Australia. Very, very remote area, very dry, very hot. And, uh, and so this, uh, this has been on a journey, this particular opal, all the way to the UK where it was set and then it was sold in the 1970s and it was bought by a very prominent family, the Ivy family here in Canada. And then it was donated to the museum uh, where it's been designated as a piece of um, cultural heritage for Canada. And so again, this is an example of something that's been on a, a major journey and along the way has gained additional stories. And Mark and McMillan tells, tells that story. I mean, she, yeah. it's, it's through her lens as a historian that she tells tells the story of the black opal ring and the, and the, the man who set it properly. And he, yeah. he's, a, he's famous in his own work as well. Absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons why the museum was very keen to acquire it is, again, it's an exquisite piece of craftsmanship alongside being a very rare artifact in its own right. And so, 
you know, that, that kind of quality is not something that you see every day. Mm. Well, I, I don't have one on my, my <laughs> finger. Okay, so another really different one, and this is, this is Springwater Palisite, and Chris Hadfield, the astronaut, writes about it, and he makes the point which, which, you know, I think a lot of people think, you look at this thing and you think, hmm, looks like a rock to me. Tell me about the Palisite. Well, can I just say, I think what's, what's amazing about this and, and the Walrus Foundation were fantastic, to have somebody who's been to outer space talking about a meteorite, to have Chris Hatfield write this was just fantastic. And he talks about the fact that, you know, he's much happier seeing this meteorite now that he's back on Earth than if it actually was hurtling towards them when he was um, on the International Space Station, which I can't really imagine. But it does look just like a rock, except when you actually look closely, it's it's like a piece of metal with tiny little specks of rock inside the metal. And so what that signals is that this was molten metal at one point and that it was mixing with rock. And so there's a lot of controversy about how these come together. But um, one of the things that we actively study at the ROM is, is the different meteorites that have landed on the Earth and what we can learn from them. So the thought for this meteorite is that it came probably from an asteroid that was big enough that it had uh, a crust and it had um, molten rock at its core, like the Earth, and that this was a piece of meteorite that broke off and represents that, that sort of intermediate space between the core of something and the outer layer. And, and what's amazing about that is that helps us learn more about the Earth. We have other meteorites in the collection as well. We have meteorites that have been knocked off Mars and then landed on the Earth or been knocked off the Moon and landed here. And so we study all of these different elements to learn more about the mm. universe. I, I, I was taken by this because it landed, this meteorite, in bigger Saskatchewan, not far from my hometown of Saskatoon, yeah. whose slogan is, New York may be big, this may be, we're bigger, this may actually prove that they're actually bigger than New York because they've had meteorite land right on their doorstep. <laughs> okay, six million objects at the ROM, 21 in this. Let's talk about the 21. Do you have a favorite that's featured in this book? No, I think it's like having children. I'm not really allowed to have a favorite <laughs> because, you know, because that will get me into trouble for an encyclopedic museum. I have to say, I do, I love all of them, but I have a new respect for them now that I've seen them interpreted by the storytellers. Mm. And so, yeah, I just like all 21. Okay, not choosing. No. Okay, every, every parent has a favorite kid, by the way, they just won't tell you. Um, how do you keep the ROM relevant in an era? I mean, you spoke a little bit about this. You know, people have access to all kinds of information. The ROM can't be what it is today, what it was 100 years ago. How do you keep the ROM relevant in 2014? So if our primary role is no longer to be the only place where you can find that information, it's certainly a place where you can learn. But it's, but it's as much now I think about that experience. And so what we're trying to do is to say, well, if we have this encyclopedic um, museum, how can we... How can we make it easy for people? And then beyond easy, how can we make it so that we can give people the sense that if they explore, that actually ignites their imagination, then they'll want to explore more. So really, the ROM becomes a place which is about inspiring curiosity. And so we do that in lots of different ways. You know, one of the ways that we do it is just by making it an enjoyable place to be, you know, a place where you can do great things, you can, you can go to the Bat Cave, you can look at the dinosaurs, all of those different things that are just, just great to be able to do. But in addition, we're thinking, as people use technology more and more, how can we make that something that becomes a seamless part of the visit? And so people already take pictures every day in the ROM. But what can we do to, so that people can use their phones and their tablets to actually take, get extra layers of information about the museum? We have started experimenting with that and we've now got our own app, which we've been using in our centennial year. We want to add to that. We, I think that we'll look forward to a situation in a few years' time where the six million objects, you can access them all when you're in the museum via your phone or via your tablet, but also you can access them elsewhere. And I think that we need to put ourselves in the shoes of our visitors and say, if we're all about creating the experience, how can we use technology to make that experience better? Is there pushback to do that? I mean, there's some traditionalists who say museums should be sort of preserved as a traditional model and all that apps and other stuff, that, that's for outside of that world. Well, there are always going to be people who say, this is how I like to use the museum. And so what I don't want to do is to say that there's any wrong way to use the museum. So of course, there are times at the ROM and there are parts of the ROM where it will always be a quiet, contemplative place where you can just look at lovely things. And what we do there is we help you really get the most from that experience. But at a time when I'm hearing from lots of people that the world 
you know, the world is increasingly dynamic. I think that we need to make sure that that's an option for people coming to the museum as well. So I've not had pushback. On the contrary, what I've heard is people saying, how can we make sure that the ROM's going to be as exciting in the future to come to as it was in the past? And that's what I've been thinking about. You know, I, I talked to lots of people who came many years ago to the ROM when they were children. We've got an incredible volunteer, Flavia, who's at the museum. She's been volunteering for 70 years. 70? 70 years. Wow. And she came, first of all, when she was a child in the 1930s. So I talked to her, and what we're both thinking about is how can we create a situation where people fall in love with the ROM now and stick with us for the next 70 years? Mm. And I think to do that, we actually have to be up to date. We can't be seen as something that's timeless or old-fashioned. On the contrary, we need to be dynamic. We need to be a work in progress. We need to give people the sense that when you come back, it will be it will be good or not better because what you were curious about before, you can go deeper this time or you can explore something else. Janet Carding, thank you. Great book, great museum. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.